All right, we're good. All right. Um, so report out on the breakout tracks. Um, let's just go in the order and they're listed. So Lisa, how did your track go? What have you got to show us? I know, but you know, we'll let her go. Back. I think she, did you, oh, she is here. Okay. Here I am. Did you want me to go first? Jean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started, I'm just going okay. in the order the tracks are listed. So you're going first. Oh, holy moly. All right, here we go. Back to sharing my screen. And I put some slides together so that here to summarize. This is I just tacked it on the end of the stuff that uh, Catherine and I presented yesterday. And this is basically what we started with, an agenda to discuss possible approaches for enabling a rendering team to specify best practice rendering for a clinical statement pattern. That was the, to address the challenge that Catherine brought forward and the, the team from THSA um, brought forward in between the, the April IAT and this one. And then to spend time evaluating the functionality of the new style sheet that Matt and Alex had developed to ch you know, check and see if we thought that it was um, ready to go. I had fl fleshed out a couple of problems with it when we brought it to Texas and um, Matt had fixed those so we just wanted to um, make sure that that style sheet was functioning properly. And uh, check out a, a kind of a new idea that John Damore brought for exploring how we could um, use this new parameter and implement it in a, a more useful way than just demonstrating it with oxygen. And then finally, to discuss the implications of this idea that we generated in April around using subsections and, um, and test out the feasibility of that. We reviewed a real world example um, that Jean was giving us from the structured product label IG, it's a pretty mature work that's been around for a long time, using subsections very effectively. And then um, consider changing the approach that we had taken to um, reconsider where the entries actually belong within a, a, a nested section strategy and look at what kind of principles we felt could be shared with the implementer community um, to see how hard or easy it would be to start using. And we, um, we had this big idea about leveraging work that had already been done in the CCDA to fire and mapping team so that we could provide a way for this new group that might be completely just focused on rendering information more um, effectively giving them a set of data elements that are packaged up in the clinical statement patterns so that they could um, contribute more easily to describing what would be ideal in terms of rendering. And the idea was to go into the CCDA on fire um, guide where they have really taken a lot of time to build these tables that describe the individual kind of data components that are present in a certain um, data structure, template structure that exists in CCDA and reinforced conceptually what that is about by mapping it to fire and adding some notes about how the two things relate. It's us pretty close to answering the question, what data is actually in this machine processable entry? And we thought that maybe with just a small amount of additional work, we'd be able to add a column that might name a sort of a, a element to be rendered that was this piece of the data and develop a short set of labeled items that we could throw on a design board and allow a rendering team to say, oh, you know, I'd really like to like, you know, put this one first and this one second, and then I want to see this one over here, and maybe this is a like a sub part of that, and, you know, do something that they could very easily work visually to lay out what how that data could be rendered to make sense, and then and then put their design work together with what uh, the technical team had 
one to kind of push us forward in um, best practice on rendering. That was pretty productive, and we felt that this was feasible. We discussed maybe kind of taking the same approach to the order, that if we were going to test some of this, I didn't put a slide on this, but that we would go back to like the Sequoia Data Usability Group and say, hey, is there a set of people that want to raise their hand and take a look at problems, and then allergies, and then medications, procedures. Take the same order, Pampy, to go through this and, uh, and, and try it out as a pilot and give us some feedback on how that works. Um, the, the, after lunch, we dug into our style sheet work that um, Matt had fixed some bugs in. We downloaded the new style sheet, kind of showed everybody where it is, how to access it, how to use this section order parameter. And then we um, we experimented with, uh, we, you know, testing it out. And um, John Damore uh, started us off by demonstrating this, this cool web tool that he had already put together just since yesterday where he could, um, he could basically expose the sections that are available in a document and then you can drag and drop these around to put them in the order that you would like and then review this, the, the document based on um, the order that you'd selected using the new style sheet. And John's going to do some, some volunteer work to beef that up a little bit, give us a nice URL where people could experiment with it. It lives in a GitHub repo, um, which includes files that actually demonstrate how he did this. So it gives people um, not only a way to experience what it's like, but a little bit of a practical programming point of view on how do you, how do you load up the section order parameter, how that might get used. Um, the group did discuss the concept is not so much to go after what the ONC style sheet had given us previously, which is kind of everybody gets to do whatever they want, but more um, the, the philosophy that groups of document users, whether it's uh, everybody at a single hospital, or a um, or single um, practice, or maybe even groups of practices around a certain um, delivery chain or a whole state, that large groups of people might be able to come together, collaboratively agree on an optimal order for their particular document type, and then apply this so that everybody was using the same order in their style sheet parameter so that you'd get that kind of consistency from place to place to place. That was the idea. So um, both, both flexibility and consistency was what we were trying to aim for. Um, we, we just went out and grabbed a bunch of samples. Um, I'm, we didn't get all the way through. It actually takes a while to do the testing because you have to consume the document, determine what sections are actually in there, then play around with the style sheet parameters. And, and to, in order to confirm that it's really having the intended effect um, and that it's adjusting the sections in the, in the right way. So we got through about one and a half, I would say, of these um, in terms of our testing. And the, uh, I'm going to finish these for the track and post this in our track like, uh, confluence page so folks would be able to um, see these sample documents along with the style sheet and um, our little Excel, Excel sheet that demonstrates um, we tested order. That was really positive. It seems really you know, good to go, and I think Matt and I intend to bring the, the word about this testing back to structured documents and at the work group meeting um, push to vote to have this uh, branch where the development's been done pulled into the, into the main line of the master and um, have a management group and structured documents issue a new style sheet. The last thing that we did in the exploration of the use of subsections is um, really kind of, we wanted to prove out through the discussion that this is not a new idea. So by looking at what they've done in SPL, and um, we didn't really look at IHE profiles, but there is a lot of use of subsections in IHE profiles. 
Um, we wanted to just help people feel comfortable that this isn't just something new to be invented. Um, and then we came to the conclusion that based on what we were seeing, that this would maybe this would likely be a useful option for managing document creation and the and processing complexity. So um, what we came up with um, to move the entries into the the outer the the outermost section so that they process just like they do today. For example, um, in the procedure section where we broke it into the the three buckets subsections for um, radiology procedures, clinical laboratory procedures, and other types of procedures, the entries are all right at the procedure section level. And it's just the narrative text that we were organizing down at the subsection level. So it was a real improvement for the use of the narrative. I'll show you a little picture of the style sheet um, processing the sections that way. It's kind of cool. Um, we even thought maybe it would be useful for the eye care guys. And so when I, when I show you that how the style sheet's working and what we did, you guys in eye care who are struggling with a lot of complexity with organizers, inside organizers, and a lot of nesting, um, that you might find this to be a useful approach. And um, finally, we kind of came to some documentation about principles, and they didn't really seem too onerous. I'll show you what we came up with. Um, we definitely determined that this requires some change in the validators. That's probably the most difficult part. So this is a picture of what we came up with for the nesting. And this example shows the procedure section. So here's your component, kind of high-level component section that holds procedures. And rather than, than um, putting all of these entries in the sections that they um, relate to, we kept, we moved all the entries out of these component sections, the subsections, and just left them right here. Just like if there was no subsections, you would just see this procedure section and here are the four entries. But by keeping the subsections for the narrative, we got a really cool effect when you apply the style sheet to the document. So again, for machine processing, it's really no different than what we do today. All of the entries, we had four entries, they're just in the procedure section. But the style sheet was able to have a very nice table of contents view where you could quickly go straight to laboratory procedures. Um, you could collapse and expand these subparts uh, or the whole section. It just had all the same sort of navigation bonus things, but without the complexity of having to dig around to find entries in different places. So we thought that was, um, that was a, a good design, and I think that would be the major adjustment that we made from last IAT, is to just um, find how the entries would be at the highest level of the section. In terms of what principles might need to be spelled out for implementers in volume one, that's where we do our sort of education about thinking about how CDA is used. We thought that we should include an explanation of this subsection strategy and that it's primarily being employed to improve human readability. Um, we definitely need to talk about how it affects um, narrative text linking, which is that it doesn't. It, it doesn't really change anything about the principles that are there. It doesn't make it any harder. You still have to do the same work, but the narrative text linking works down into the, uh, from the subsection dot text area to the entries. There's no difference there. And then finally, we probably put some examples in to really show how to put the entries in the outermost section um, make it clear that that was the, our, going to be the approach so that we could minimize the process complexities. Really very little change for uh, anything that's right now. And show how it is that we, um, uh, the decisions that we made about making sure that there's enough semantics in the entry to know which subsection the narrative is going into. And um, worked. So maybe a couple extra examples.
Um, the, the biggest problem we found is that for the scorecard and the um, site testing, the two places where we put subsections in, you can see we scored a D and uh, a, a bunch of conformance errors, very bad, um, for the results section. So um, this was this section was where the entries were still nested down underneath, and this is where we, we pushed them up to the higher level. So that's why you see the difference in the behaviors. Just some of the examples of stuff that would need to be addressed with our validator developers is um, how it checks to see if the narrative text linking is working, some, some notions of whether or not you've got just a single code. Shall contain exactly one code. There's When you nest, this error comes up because there's not just one code. There's all the codes from the subsections that are down lower. And um, finally, for sections where entries are required, um, it seemed like um, like in the results section, well, I guess this would actually be addressed if we push the entries up to the higher level. But right now in the results section, I hadn't moved them yet. So we were getting errors where the results section was bombing out because entries were required. The entries were there. They were just in the subsection, not in the higher level. So we just have to kind of straighten some of that stuff out with our um, validator people. But, you know, they're going to have a lot of work to do anyway with the new version of consolidated CDA talked about how to accelerate adoption, and I guess I came up with the lame idea of writing an article <laughs> in the HL7 newsletter, and people were like, yeah, that's not going to have any impact. So um, we, we came up with another idea about bringing this forward to the group, this new group that's a joint project across Sequoia and AHIMA that's called Data Usability Taking Roots, a project that Didi reported on. And um, there's a lot of focus on ways to improve narrative, the use of narrative text, and that's really what we'd be doing, plus the other stuff that the team from Texas has been talking about. So we might get some traction there um, by talking about it with that group. But more importantly, there's a lot of testing tools that the Sequoia group um, creates as the RCE. They have a lot of impact on big organizations across networks like um, Care Quality, Commonwealth, um, soon the whole TESCA network. And these testing tools could be a great way to rapidly um, require organizations to respond to some new stuff like this, support certification of, of um, operating in those big networks. So that seemed to be our best ideas in terms of how we could accelerate adoption. And we finished a little bit early, so we started, we said, gave our time, ourselves some time to scratch our heads about what else we might think about. And the question came up of, like, how are we doing document rendering for fire documents? And nobody really knew. It just seems like a gap area that we haven't thought too much about. But when we started thinking about it, um, everybody agreed. We're still going to need some sort of style sheet to handle rendering fire documents. And all of these issues that we're talking about today, about usability and um, maybe even subsetting of, of subsectioning of sections and making the content more consumable by the humans, it's all going to be equally relevant. And maybe this is the time to start thinking about this, not just as a CDA issue, but as an issue that will also affect our fire documents. And maybe we can be killing two birds with one stone as we're making improvements for CDA. We'll just start off on a better foot with fire, um, benefiting from what we've, what we've learned with this earlier standard. So that was everything that we covered. Um, I don't know if folks have questions or if they want me to show anything else dig in a little bit more on anything, we're going to try and put all this up on the track page. You'll have access to it. That was our that was our track. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Chukinder here. Just wondering uh, about what are the logical next steps now? Well, for the style sheet work, the the next steps 
are to finish the validation of those documents and then get the style sheet published. Mm -hmm. And um, I think those... I think those would be the big. I think those would be the big actions for the style sheet. Um, for the collaborating approach, I think it would be taking this idea to the Sequoia group to see if there's anybody that wants to create a rendering team and give this a try, so that we could prototype or or pilot the idea, see if it if it works. There's a guy named Joe Schneider from the Texas group who was really big on this idea. I might reach out to him as well. And for the subsectioning, I think we should enter some JIRA tickets because there are no tickets to request anything be done in consolidated CDA. And I think the idea would be to maybe formulate one or two JIRA tickets that bring up this quest specifically for the procedure section and the results section and get that in the works to be considered for consolidated CDA. Cool. Well, that's a good idea, Lisa. I, I think I did try to do this when we were doing Claire, but not in the way that you did. And that's it, this is a great idea. So I did create the expandable collapsible sections, but I still had to put the entries in each of the components in order for it to validate. But this this is a neat idea. Get all those, Jaginder. I know we're recording. Um, so I think that'll, I, I think this would probably be an, an action item also is to is to also bring this topic of subsectioning to the Sequoia Data Usability Taking Roots project and discuss this. This is Jim. It just seems to me, Lisa, that that was a lot of work accomplished to be able to also add, we finished early. <laughs> <laughs> well, we everybody was doing something. Linda was looking up LOINC codes and Matt was finding other CDA documents and it was a, it was a, a group effort. And Lawrence from DHIT was um, providing so much good insight. John was there to help us with the SPL stuff. It was a it was a great team effort. Sounds that way. And I would say, Jim, how long have you known Lisa? Wouldn't you expect that? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yes. <laughs> See, the, Lisa was one of the first people that I met at HL7, and my expectation is everybody at HL7 was just like Lisa. Yeah. Not yes, nearly. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. We are all just. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing, Lisa, you mentioned on the uh, documents in in Fire, and I know that the rendering uh, rendering um, we've talked about using Liquid templates for that in some of the work we've done. We've never done it, but we've talked about it, and I believe. They're also talking about using liquid templates for measures to for the human readable in measures. So that seems to be what, what... are liquid templates. Um, it, I, Jean, I'll throw it to you. Uh, you know, uh, no. Oh well, it's it, it. You can use it for many things. It's almost like user friendly coding. For example, Microsoft's Fire Converter uses liquid templates. So you can define things and then, you know, say how they should be moved or display, well, moved around, which essentially makes them a, you know, displayed um, kind of thing. But you, that's what, um, that's what we were talking about doing in the, it is a composition at the guest and care report. We just, no one ever seemed all that interested in taking that final step, but to display all of the pieces in some sort of a logical way. 
Bryn was a big, mm. is a big fan of liquid templates. So is Rob Reynolds, if you know him. They're both very knowledgeable on the topic. Hmm. Well, if you keep getting exposed to that stuff, Linda, I'm going to note that on the slide just as a, as a concept to be watching what's going on with that. But if you learn mm -hmm. more about it, maybe we can keep this progress going sure. at the next IAT and see what else we learn. Sounds magical. All right. Yeah, I've been staring at them for ADTs for the last few days. Doesn't feel all that magical, but <laughs> just just for your context, Lisa. So I know about the liquid. So the liquid, it's a there's a liquid template language. I'm not sure if that's exactly what he's talking about. It was a language yes. created by Shopify, written in Ruby on Rails. And yeah, we use liquid templates in uh, in the fire and in the IGs as well. Right? Ah, perfect. Okay. But I mean, what you were talking about, though, Lisa, is I thought like if you had like a, you know how you have like a navigation page or a home page with, with drag and drop capabilities to order them, you know, something like that might be, you know, simple enough to handle. But anyway, that's anyway, cool. It's kind of, to my in my mind, and John, now that you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> it's kind of like the um, style sheet is that you yeah. can use it to the equivalent of the style sheet for fire. Yep. All right, uh, so that's that track. Um, Jim and, and or Rochelle, carry on your track. How did things go? I can let Rochelle go first and report on her part of it. So we um, regrouped on the information that was covered yesterday regarding um, the V2 and V3 of USCDI. Um, we collaborated a little bit more on the, the different clinical tests um, and I think we have a couple of takeaways from there to just um, look at if there's any reason for us to separate tests besides lab to into radiology and other templates. Uh, I think that's still something to discuss at other meetings to understand if we want to go that direction. Um, I think it was decided for sure that this is a terminology process that you're going to have to do in order to if you're trying to do any type of mapping from CCA to FIRE, um, when it comes to the results, you're going to have to use a terminology server to help with that process. It's not something you're gonna be able to do one-to-one -one from the CCA to FIRE. And that's still up for discussion to see if there's anything more we wanna do there. Um, we talked about the implementation guides and understanding where the implementation guides are and um, using the ONC SVAP links to help understand what implementation guides are approved and, and ready for implementation through the SVAP program um, to help with updating to V2 and V3 in your CCDAs and other documents you may have. Uh, we briefly touched on payer just to recap that at this point, the, the way the implementation guide is currently laid out in CDA, that is how we are handling the payer, but we should be looking at the 4.1 um, implementation guide for CCDA to ensure the companion guide to ensure that we are following that protocol properly and implementing um, the payer accordingly. So there is no crossover yet that we're doing with DaVinci or those implementation guides at all. Um, it, we're handling as is in the current guides. What did I forget? Um, did I forget anything? A lot of that crossed over and helped with some of the communication that we were having with the um, with uh, the specialties related to the IG guide that we're currently working on for eye care. And I'll turn that over to Jim. Thanks, Michelle. Yes, yeah, so we looked at, uh, you know, we just went through this process where we had the EHRs actually implement uh, visual acuities and refraction. And our goal, as we said in our prioritization of what we were trying to accomplish 
was really for a specific use case, which was the visual acuity to be used in a post-op report. Um, but, you know, looking at the IG that we're writing, um, the EHRs that have been involved in this process uh, certainly identified a number of issues that we can expand that capability with. It includes uh, multiple entries on some of the similar data types. I'm going to have Dennis talk about that. That was one issue that we spent quite a bit of time on. The other one is we had um, some discussion of provenance and uh, its significance on some of the use cases that happen within specialty care where we're not really looking at data being updated once, we're looking at data going into one organization and then being recreated and going to another organization as being almost the norm, not, not uh, an odd situation, but almost what happens very frequently and potentially some implications on provenance there. So I'm gonna ask Dennis to talk about the, uh, the first issue with the VA and refraction. I think you're muted, Dennis. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry, my screen switched on me. Um, can you see the Word document now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, so we, we had some... Just, sorry, just to be clear, we're seeing both of your screens, so it's pretty... Simple. Both? Oh, okay. You don't need to see both. I'll show them. There's just a lot of screen there. I thought I picked this one. Obviously, I didn't click right, and that's there fine. I'm yeah. trying to close it down. That's why I probably I lost my... Uh, Mute. Okay, so for the CDA specialty, so obviously we had a little bit of a, as Jim said, a bit of a connectathon style where we tried to do some transmissions between a few different EHRs, and there was several EHRs that could actually generate the VA and the refraction in the document, and then there was one that was able to consume it and generate it. And in the process of doing all that, we did run into some some takeaway items that we need to take a look at. And it was like, how do you handle multiple sets? So normally, you know, with eye care data, you would expect that you would only include one final Rx, but in fact, there's use cases to include multiple sets. And how do we associate those? And how do we, you know, make them so that they're obvious um, in terms of what's what in the document when it actually gets sent to a receiver. So our action items are, we need to update the eye care implementation guide to handle multiple sets of data. And for the case of the final or extra prescriptions, we would have to include a prescription usage result to say what it was being created for. Um, some of the other things that came up are, you know, if you're sending multiple encounters with multiple sets of clinical data, how do you handle that? And what we talked about is possibly using an entry relationship so that each result item or at the organizer level it specifically would have um, a link to the encounter or the diagnosis code. I should turn on the video. Sorry, guys. Okay. And, and then, of course, I did have this in our, we haven't put it in the IG at all, but to have like section time range observation, which is for a result organizer or for a whole section, you can limit, you know, the amount of data that's going to be shared. In, in optometry ophthalmology, the common use case would be to send like a referral or, you know, a diabetic report or an op note or a progress report, and you would only generally be including one set of results so it wouldn't need to handle the multiple cases but there you know as we talked to other ehrs it came apparent that that you know could be something we'd have to handle um, again also qualifiers so handling in eye care we have different pieces of data where you have one snowmed code for a particular data in this case it's a prism and the prism value is the same regardless of whether it's horizontal or vertical, but you have to be able to qualify that. And currently in the result observation, the only way to put a qualifier like that would be to do something like an interpretation code. And does that make sense? For me, it, you know, it didn't make 100% sense, so we need to 
take a look at these four issues and determine how we're going to incorporate those into the guide. Uh, second, there was, as Jim said, we talked about some other things like the communication scenarios and the data provenance and, you know, how do we handle multiple levels. So in that case, the takeaway is we're going to need to include some verbiage in the, the IG that kind of talks about these different scenarios and how you would handle it. So for instance, in data provenance, um, if I received a document from a primary eye care physician that, you know, took the, in this case, blood pressure, let's just say blood pressure, height and weight, and they sent it to me. And then of course, I've incorporated that, reconciled it into my EHR. Um, and then you wanted to then regenerate, modify it, have your exams, you perform your diabetic retinal exam, and then you want to basically send that data back out. Would you send the height and weight? Now, a primary care physician would definitely do that, but not all optometrists are going to do blood pressure readings. And so they might get a reading from the patient that says, oh, my blood pressure is high. This is what it would, I think it was. And you might enter that into the exam rather than taking physical readings. So for us, the provenance from an eye care perspective is super important. If you're sending that back out, are you taking ownership of that provenance? Or you're going to say, well, here's the last blood pressure reading that came from a primary eye care physician and you attach their provenance back on the outgoing document. I don't think that that you know, from at least from my perspective, from my care, I don't think that's been handled. We always make sure the provenance is correct coming in for reconcile, but then as you generate, you know, new documents, you have new visits and exams, is that handled? And then, of course, we also need to include guidance for communication scenarios, like when would you include all the data from my care? They might be doing that if, you know, the patients move to a different state, and now you want to send all the visual acuity, refraction, eye care, clinical data to them. And it would make sense for them to, you know, incorporate and consume that. But it wouldn't make sense to send all the data if you were just sending the patient to an ophthalmologist for a referral or for, say, a lens extraction or a lens replacement. And then we got talking into value sets and and from a perspective of the final Rx. So value sets would be like, we wanna create all the different method codes that you would use. That's interesting, excuse me one sec, just get rid of that. Okay, you would, all, you would want to put some of the method codes like for when you're doing a final Rx, we would like to define all the valid codes that should be used within the eye care guide so that we're actually defining all the levels. So the first level would be the 12 sections that would go under the physical findings of the eye. And then under there, we would put all the subsections under there. And we want to try to quantify those into actual value sets or groups that can be used and potentially created and authored on the VSAC. And then I put a, a few things in here um, Rachelle, which uh, we talked about the lab radiology separation, which you mentioned challenges with respect to picking the guide. And I do have a couple links, one to the standards version for the SVAP and then one to the online search tool. Um, and I'll send this to Susan and John to include. And we had lots of other lengthy discussions related to all of these items and it took up the whole time and we ran out. And that's on the issue, need, Jim, back to you. Thanks. On the issue of provenance, I just wanted to see if Gay wanted to add anything to that, because provenance is a bigger issue that I know a lot of people are addressing. Is there any, you know, the use cases that we were talking about, Gay, is there anything that we should be passing along to another, any other group working on provenance, or is there an action item we should be doing with that? Um, I don't think so. I think you had a handle on it I, I don't know if um you know one of the things that come to light were not come to light but it's always been thought about I and mean, it's never really been um you know figured out a way to really do it well is we've the the current provenance is basically last top right so yeah, but... from the last place you got it and and so you know I think some of the stuff we talked about today touched on that a little bit. Like, you know, what happens if you've got these other you know, CCD come in and then you generate a new CCD? And we talked about IDs and the retention of unique IDs or not in the different um, different uh, uh, CAs. And so that's 
interesting to think about. I think some vendors do it really well and others possibly don't. So yeah. uh, and well, there's not really something that, I don't think we really have guidance that says, and maybe no. Lisa, you know better than I, but um, I don't know that we've really talked too much about the aspect of uh, unique IDs in the provenance process. Yeah, it's come up a little bit in terms of deduping from like, if you talk about HbA1c, but you're right, I don't think it, the wider subject has been brought up. That IG that Dee Dee referenced um, that was published by Sequoia that was aimed at data usability. Yes. There's a chapter in there about persistent ID practices. Uh, um, I yes. know a, a few people were involved in thinking about it and crafting some suggestions and best practices, but I think that's our best documentation we have right now for where people are at yeah. thinking about it. It's a good idea. See, for me, for the for the data provenance, which I I know for certification, they only test the last hop, but I mean, from a safety perspective, you know, if there is a problem, say somebody had high, you know, really high blood pressure, they weren't, you know, there was no diagnosis of <clears throat> hypertension, you know, maybe they had a, a soft aneurysm or something happened and they were hospitalized, who would they go to? Would they go back to the optometrist? Well, you created this entry, so we want to find out more about the context of the patient you really want them to go back to the primary care physician. Like to me, it seems like a safety issue if we don't deal with the provenance of multi levels. Okay. But okay. I, I've been thinking that you know, if you if you had a time machine so that you could easily just go like in your way back to your way back machine to the t the point in time where problems are very first diagnosed. So the day before you didn't have this problem diagnosed. And now it's at the day that you first know that you have a certain problem, somebody diagnoses it. It seems like if the ID that was associated with that very, very first diagnosis um, was the one that persisted, so that anybody else who gets that information after it was recorded for the first time just follows the pattern to say that's a diagnosis that you already had. Now I'm just learning about it, you know, from some either you you shared a document with me or I queried for a document and pulled something in yeah. and just always use that original ID and not make up or maybe you have to have your own plus one or something. But somehow if we could get to a place where the moment in time when something comes is first documented, that that's the ID that becomes some sort of a forever identifier associated with that piece of information. And then you just keep that with it. Well, that's absolutely, that's where I think the Sequoia project and the no two and the Commonwealth and the care quality, like if, for instance, the patient goes to a primary care physician and they diagnose the problem, but then the patient decides to go and get their, you know, eyes checked for like an annual exam just for whatever and they get you know refraction and they get that done they may document the problem a second time but there was no knowledge of the previous visit because maybe they didn't mention it so with the no two network where you can say well let's find out if there was a previously generated ccda Look before you and leave. bring that in you know, if that was always what we did, Dennis, was everybody just did look before yes. you leap, you know, check yeah. before you start documenting and anything that's already known about the patient, don't make up new IDs. It's exactly. Not new information. Exactly. I guess it's just if you don't know what you don't know, right? So the problem is that's where, you know, a lot of ophthalmology gyms brought this up in the past where they, you know, they they do get a referral, say, from a primary eye care physician, but they don't send the CCDA or any document. So you really want to have context. If you're, especially if you're doing a diabetic exam, you want that HbA1c. You need some real context because you're going to use that in the assessment and the analysis, then and potentially the outcome of you know what happens for that patient. Mm -hmm. So yeah, following, agreed. Following up on the conversation we had yesterday relating to that. On the, it's interesting that we use date of diagnosis even when we don't know the date of diagnosis, and then we assume that it's when it started treating. But that just seems real problematic to me. It just seems that we should document. 
a diagnosis well, it's, with, with it's two It sort of is, but I mean, John and, and Lisa, they all touched on that. And, and that's why you have the low and the high. And that's why you can say, well, this is when I first knew about it, because you don't have any context to anything else. And so I do get, you know, the 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 implementation guides and that do provide that mechanism, but I see what you're saying. Like, why would you even do that? Right. Well, we do so, have, you know, I don't what, know if you guys were, you know, where uh, one session yesterday we kind of clarified the data diagnosis yes. versus onset versus resolution and, and the current representation and then potentially, you know, some differences between what resolution versus um remission or whatever it means and you know in fire versus cda and, and or the capture not that one out not that it means different um anyway so we do specifically have a data diagnosis which is very often different than data onset absolutely and then you you actually explained it very well i think i think from jim's point of view though he's just thinking well you shouldn't even like if if you were you know, a patient comes to see you and you've never seen, you know, they tell us you that it had diabetes and they say, well, I think it was in 1998. We don't have anything else to go on. I think what Jim's saying is that why would you even say that it was potentially in 1998? It could have been in 1990 for all the patient knows. And maybe there's a safety issue with even attempting to say, well, this is the first time I knew about it. Right. Well, the, um, the, the definition is the date diagnosed by a professional. So by a professional. You know, like you theoretically, you sort of bleh, theoretically yeah. wouldn't. But you know, on the other hand, a patient advocate is going to say, well, you know, listen to me. I know when I, how long I've had diabetes, even though I might not know the, the exact date. So we just have to be a little bit sensitive. Well, that's it. a good distinction. Yeah. If you're, if you're getting it from the patient, you can't really, or even an advocate can't really trust that it should be coming from a, another doctor so if you don't know a date of diagnosis you should be able to say unknown but you then can. record the date of the first the first treatment that's what you're really and you can have onset i mean you could reflect that and like if the patient says oh i've had it i don't know for 10 years so that's you know whatever that was you know 2013 so you could put that in your data you could have, you could have that additional onset Right, yeah. but not necessarily declared as a data diagnosis. Exactly. I think that's why it was important that you brought it up, Gay, because I mean, it's it's pretty clear about what you can do in the implementation guides and the companion guides. It's really about how the EHRs have implemented it. So right. if, you know, if the doctor decides to put in 1998 for that date because the patient told them, then that's how it's going to get represented into the CCDA potentially. And eventually, yeah. sometimes those things just become fact. Like in, you know, when I carried my little four by four list of pencil written immunizations that my, you know, my 10 years long dead mom gave me, <laughs> you know, I, to the phys physician, and then he writes that in his record that then becomes fact. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing with the provenance. One of the discussions we had with provenance is, you know, it can be handled well in the CCDA, but if that provenance information isn't readily available to the clinician, that's a problem, right? If I'm a clinician and I got a referral from an optometrist, I need to easily be able to see if the optometrist put that weight in where they just asked the patient and stuck in anything just because they're required to do it to meet meaningful use versus a physician that has, you know, a certified scale that did it. So me being able to see that that weight came from the primary care physician. So even though it's in the CCDA, if it doesn't somehow carry over and to be easily visible to the clinicians using the EHR, it really doesn't have any value. So I still can't trust the data if I can't see that provenance as a, as a provider. And again, that's an implementation thing. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a guidance thing. I think it's how it's implemented by the EHR's issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm curious, when you said consume, you were talking about just the typical things an EMR consumes, right? Out of a, a the PAMI stuff, right? Yeah, I'm talking about additional consumption. So like, for instance, in the HR, I worked on a couple different EHRs. So um, even from day one, back in 2011, I implemented the ability to consume or so. So you have to do medications, allergies, and problems, right? That's the way that it started with certification. I also did procedures, encounters, lab orders, lab results. I added like about five or six more sections. So in the software that 
that I worked on, they had all of those sections all the time. What we're talking about here is for eye care data, we want to add these sections using the known patterns like result, organizer, observation, and potentially we could do these subsections that Lisa's talking about, but we want to include all this data so that it can be sent to an ophthalmology system and consumed and used you know, as part of the chart, primarily in co-management of cataracts, you know, lens replacement, um, you know, referrals for diabetic retinopathy exams, things like that, where it really should be sent back to the providers in question and incorporated into the HR. So we do want this to be consumed. It won't be official because it's not part of certification, but we do want, you know, more sections to be actually available. Right, but there's also that in-between data. So there's the, the data that we have to consume for certification, but there's a lot of other data in USCDI-1 that makes sense to consume, like the problem list and uh, like height, weight, and blood pressure that comes from the primary care physician. That makes sense to consume that and bring it in. Uh, you know, way early in the process, one of the uh, directors of ONC made the statement that our goal is if somebody in healthcare has recorded something, nobody else should ever have to record it. So that data that's in that CCDA, unless we're thinking of the CCDA as a reference document that a provider looks at during the episode of care, if we're consuming that data, we're putting it in the CCDA because we think there's value. Unless it all gets consumed, then we have to make that document visible to the clinician. <clears throat> so that other data that we're all agreeing, yep, it needs to be in the CCDA, but then we've only said you have to consume these, you know, three or four categories. What are we doing with that other data? What I'm saying is there's a lot of value to some of that data that we do want to be able to consume. And, uh, you know, an example of that is blood pressure and height and weight, because, you know, your primary care physician is a better source of that than a lot of the specialty offices are. So we right. do want to consume and, that also. And keeping in mind as well that for Linda, I still think it should follow the proper certification process. So it should go through a reconciliation and the receiving provider should decide what they want to consume or what they don't Definitely. like. It still needs to follow yes. that process. Yeah. Yeah, and I I hear this a lot. Uh, recently, I've heard it about care plans. The provider wants to see care plan from other plan. providers yes. in their in their EMR, but I, I don't feel like their EMR. I'm curious, are there um, any of the vendors on here besides you, Dennis? Do Do you know of EMRs that actually consume more than the PAMI or whatever? I'm I don't know all the different vendors. No, I don't I don't think so. Oh, I mean I was asking, I think we have Epic and Cerner and ECW. Yeah. Anyone else, yeah. yeah I mean if you go ahead, Matt. Um we certainly do consume more than PAMI. Um like um the scope and you know the, the details of like what we do or don't consume and like how are you know a little I, I don't think we need to bother getting into it but um there definitely are vendors who um are consuming other stuff yeah yeah I've I seen think like labs out of ORUs and stuff too I should say but yeah yeah yeah, we, we added lab results and orders, I can't remember, I think it was in 2012, just after the first certification passed, because we thought that it was needed and we just left it in. Um, but I mean, if you're following the spirit of certification, I think, you know, you know, people, the whole idea was here's medications, allergies, problems, but it would make sense to be able to consume or, you know, import data from receive CCDAs for a lot of different reasons. And I thought that the spirit was, well, here's the three you have to do, but you know, you really should bring in more like the vitals, you know, there's the plan of care. I think there is a definitive template for plan of care. And even in certification, you could actually incorporate that. Plan of care is complicated. Uh, somebody funded a study. It was the Hudson Valley study. Is anybody familiar with that? It was done I'm guessing 20 years ago, and it was how when you have care plans coming in from multiple sources, 
how you combine them. Um, does anybody remember that study? I don't, I just, that would be complicated, though. I mean, obviously, everybody has their different care plans. And what if, you know, three different doctors say you should get an A1C every three months? And Exactly. Right. So they, if I'm correct, the result of that study was a recommendation that EHRs should support two outside care plans that the provider can look at separately because it's so complicated to combine them. So I, I'm pretty sure <clears throat> that that study did not really result in a process to combine multiple sources in a care plan. It was just too complicated. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And I so, think there are ways to share the care plan, but just the incorporation into the provider's record is what we're yeah, Thinking it's more right. like import. It's the reconciliation process that I mean by consume. So it would be right. really should be reconciliation because you're basically receiving a CCDA, you're reconciling the sections, and you're determining which ones you want to incorporate into the patient's chart right. or not. So consume doesn't doesn't equal right. Then. No, it does not. Yeah, that's what I I saw your message. I wanted to clarify that. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. It's not right. Yeah. I, I put uh, just in the discussion about care plan this time. Uh, it's personal advertisement. Um, the, the multiple chronic care condition care plan was that fire IG that's in ballot uh, right now. So love to have people have a look at it and comment. And also there's a section in the front that is having to do with patient friendly, patient friendly language or, or um, plain language summary about an IG that we're considering uh, putting mm -hmm. into the fire IG template and requiring it in, in all IGs, similar to how a lot of uh, articles, uh, uh, journal articles require now something similar. So um, anyway, I would love to have people comment on it. Hey, I don't understand consume does not equal right. Um, well, well like, I'll let yeah. Dennis restate, yeah. Yeah, so, so right, when you say right, I guess if you print, we gotta really go through those, but so the two things for me is you're generating a CCDA to send to somebody. And so right to me would be generating the CCDA and creating that to then communicate it to somebody else. So when you receive a CCDA, you reconcile it. And if you wanna say, does it write to the database uh, for the patient's chart? I guess you could talk about it in that form, but if we follow certification terminology, you reconcile the read the the chart versus what you got with the CCDA, and you decide what you want to incorporate. Right. Now, once There's you incorporate, human intervention. Yeah, you're writing it to the database. If that's what right. you're it's thinking, it's not like that. this is a you know the annual problem where you know interoperability is great, but nobody wants to just automatically take things into their system. Exactly, right. and they may already have it. So you're you're doing kind of a deduplication process, right. and you're bringing in things that are relevant to to your the provider's discipline, right? And their specialty. So, and there may be things that you don't want to bring in. Um, so when you say consume, does that mean that reconciliation process when you say, yes, that's consume? Yes. Yeah, okay. you, you basically, then, yeah. You've agreed then, on which items, sorry, go ahead. Well, the, so does right mean you don't share it back out? Is that what you yeah, mean by right? So like, uh, the way I would yeah. look at it is, yeah, can I, yeah, I consume a CCD. That means I can take it into my system and look at it. I have, you know, a provider oh. can look at it, right? And then there's this reconciliation or adjudication process where the, where the provider can say, oh, yeah, add this, add this, add this, don't add this stuff, right? And then it goes into the database, right? You, there's not any EHR that I know of Ryan, please tell me if I'm wrong, Dennis, that we'll just take in whatever is sent to them and add it to the record. No, no, that's correct. It goes Without into reconciliation, right? Yeah. Well, if if there's if there is no patient, you know, we still give the, the provider the option. They could incorporate the entire CCDA well, the sections that we import, medication allergies, maybe the patient details into the chart, but it has to be for a patient that doesn't exist you have to reconcile it if the patient exists. That's a mandatory step. And it, it becomes an, an important clinical question of where that reconciliation occurs, right? So 
I, somebody from Epic might be able to answer this. My understanding is if there's a perfect match, Epic puts those received CCDAs right in, attaches it to the right to the patient folder. And then the expectation is when the patient comes in, a nurse or a technician or somebody does the reconciliation at that point, because if you have two pieces of data that don't match, but they're talking about the same thing, uh, the only person that might know which is correct is the patient themselves. So if you do that reconciliation at the time the patient's sitting in front of you, it tends to be smoother and easier than if you say, okay, we're gonna assign a person to, to take all these CCDAs as an administrative task and reconcile them prior to the exam. Is that correct, mm -hmm. uh, either Ryan or Matt? Uh, yeah, I would say in my experience, that's been the workflow that I've primarily seen is that um, most reconciliation tends to occur like just before the visit or right with the patient yeah. by the relevant provider that's about to see the patient. Um, <clears throat> the first part you mentioned is kind of related more to like patient matching. Like if we got pushed a document, do we know where it belongs? Sometimes we don't, and then it has to go to a, you know, a, a person to intervene and figure out if we know that patient or not. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think so. I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you definitely should not be just randomly loading the data. It has to be reviewed by somebody before it's incorporated and reconciled. But that's an important step in what we're talking about here is, you know, as we take specialty HRs that really haven't been using direct messaging and we're starting using it, it's an important issue to be thinking about of how we incorporate that into the HRs that, you know, the, that, like, like Ryan just said, um, making sure that it's really easy for the end user to be able to do that at the time that the patient's in front of them so they can uh, you know, comment on any inconsistencies in the which in what you're trying to do. Otherwise, it raises a whole bunch of work that has to be done as a sideline. Yeah, so I think enough. this yeah. is where I think this is where it definitely is very different for the specialty or just ambulatory EHR systems compared to hospital systems because the hospital system is generally going to send that through the his department, right? So it's going to be validated that it's the right patient, it's going to be matched, and it's going to go to the data. Whereas what you're saying seems very valid and may not be something that a primary care physician would want to do to reconcile anything themselves. Um, but an administration or a MA or someone that can review the data prior to the visit and reconcile that data ahead of time may be a workflow in other systems. Just want to be really clear that the ONC process has very distinct points. Um, transitional care in is incorporate only. It, it's not to, um, you. Only, they call it incorporation of your CCD, which is what Gay said for consume. You can consume yeah. it, you can see it. The incorporation matches it to a patient, but you're not supposed to match it automatically ever. It's, it's against the... Head out, Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. So, um, but having a list of patients or the one patient that you could match to is completely yeah. acceptable. You're you're right. Um, there's there's a whole there's a whole bunch of stuff around it, Rachel. You're totally right. Like we right. we would do exactly that. We don't just attach it to the patient. You have to then do a matching algorithm. You have to then put up all the possibilities. Let the doctors select. There's a it's a whole process. Agreed. So that, so that comes down to usability, right? It's a big usability issue when you say that you're going to have to do that on every patient. Um, that's, that's a consideration because that decreases the chances people are going to use it if you put a process in place. Like if there's an automatic match that is really obvious, there should be some way of letting the automatic match work bring it up and say, the system thinks this is the patient, do you agree? Uh, and if it's not this patient, these are the other possibilities. So it's still doing a, a, an auto match. It, it's just using that technology uh, so the, the user just at a glance can tell that. They don't have to do a search themselves for the patient. 
Yeah, there there can be problems with that though, Jim. Like if you had uh, somebody that was married and their last name changed, and they had a two charts in the system, one was active, one wasn't, it would probably match the wrong one potentially if their maiden name was still in the CCDA. There's there's a bunch of complex, you know, issues around automatic patient matching and electronic but, but, EMPI. Right, but that's that's still you're still taking care of that because in the first step you're saying this looks like the patient. And you know you have to agree with that before. So if those issues occurred and you're talking to the patient, you can resolve that. That's the idea of having the patient in front of you is to resolve those exact kind of issues. Whereas you can't do that is an administrative step. When you do it outside, you're more likely to actually resolve the issue correctly if you're in front of the patient, where you can ask them, "Is this you?" Yeah. <clears throat> no. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm with Rachel on that, but I understand what you're saying, Jim. It, yeah, I'm just concerned sense. about provider burden because yeah. we, if we don't talk about that with every single thing that we implement, we end up putting in processes that become just too time consuming. And, you know, everybody at ONC knows there's a huge problem with physician burnout and stuff. And it's by these things that just take too much effort. So uh, you, we need to be able to make sure that we're accurate with still being able to do, with still being able to have, you know, efficiency. Makes sense. Good. Um, so the only other thing that we did is uh, one of the issues in our project that we're involved in right now that kind of led to being able to demonstrate the VA in refraction. It's a very short term project and it has a very limited scope, but there's a lot of specialty data that needs to be mapped. So we had sort of defined our process to kind of the independent providers like eye care and dentistry and physical therapy and those type of groups. But the reality is what we're really doing is mapping, starting the process of mapping clinical data into the CCDA using the physical exam section. And there's a lot of carryover in the rest. So we had some discussion with Ryan from Epic of how does that carry over for large EHRs? Is, there, is what we're doing in this program have some carry over, carry over that will help everybody else, not just that small subsection that we're talking to as specialty EHRs? Is there some overlap into the, the, the because you know all of the large hospital systems have ophthalmology departments and optometry departments where uh, those providers work within large systems and use the large um, you know the large EHRs. So you know it looks like there is some overlap. And then the next question with that: Are there specialties that are almost always within hospital systems outside of what we talked about? I'll just say OBGYN or uh, you know, any other group that's usually primarily within a hospital is the process, are the processes that we're creating to map specialty data to the physical exam, is there carryover in those areas also? And uh, it seems like the consensus is potential there is. So one of the things that uh, Ryan agreed that we should do is we're going to be scheduling a visit with Ryan and hopefully Matt and whoever from their team to have a more in-depth discussion of that to see if there's some additional carryover that this project that we're involved in could be involved in more so um, in as we move ahead. Anything else you want to add, Dennis? You're, you're muted, Dennis. Yeah, I was just trying to get to the mute. No, Jim, I didn't when you, when you, Jim, when you yeah. talk about carryover, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you mean specific overlap or if you mean some sort of general thing that is, that actually is a window into scalability, like <laughs> patterns that if you're doing these certain patterns and you could teach the patterns and anyone could apply it in some specialty area so we could get more people contributing to helping this grow faster. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Lisa. So that we kind of all use that physical exam section the same way, or at least other people know what the decisions that we made of how to use it, because there's a lot of decisions being made. Right? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's somehow sharing not just the specifics, but the general the general patterns that you're learning. Yeah, the general of other people. Exactly. Yep. Yep. We could we I could produce like, some sorry, go ahead, Dina. Well, I was just gonna say I feel like that falls under Dee Dee's project with the the root the Ahima work because they want their focus even from the beginning has been around um providers and the usability of the of that work to providers. Maybe not. Well, we no, I think it's a I think it's a great point. And we have two things from the other from the discharge summary track. Maybe we need to get with Didi and say, could we do some sort of IAT update to the data usability taking root group and bring three things or what, you know, if you guys have one or two things, I have one or two things from the, from the um, discharge summary track and like report out to them and see how we put our, our cross community efforts together. And if anybody's interested in, uh, I used to know there's a, there's a huge number of physicians involved. I shouldn't say huge. They always need more. There are physicians involved. It isn't just the, the techie guys, right. that are sitting there saying, well, the mood code should be whatever it's so, you know, seriously, take a look at it. And uh, if you especially like you, uh, Jim, if you're into the, the clinical role, it, it in Da Vinci, we always say our business me's are so important. And in this role, I'm saying the clinicians are so important that, it, you know, you have to be there and give your voice. Last impassioned plea of the day, I promise. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a good point because Jim did bring a lot of the eye care EHRs and we're trying to get a, more of them on board to do exactly that, Linda, to get to allow, you know, a wider general audience in terms of being able to voice, you know, their what they want. And the people who show up at those things is what ends up in them. Yeah. And, and I worry about that a lot, even with our fire IGs. They represent the people that show up, right? And so, yeah. It's true. So I think that, and Jim, a lot of the concerns you have are not limited to eye care. Right. All right, do you have anything else, or? Well, that was a great uh, feedback and report back and great discussion. All right, so we're half an hour early, which is fine. Um, in behind the scenes, we've been talking about we left an hour, 45 minutes for two tracks to report out, so that's too much. That's okay, we'll, we'll end a bit early. We're on to the closing discussion and plan for the next IET. So um, I'd love to hear from people. I think this IET has been great, as all of them are, but I, I really liked the discussion yesterday. All the presentations and the tracks today seem fantastic. Does anyone have any feedback? There will be, Dave, I'm assuming there will be a survey that we're going to send out. Yep. Yep. All right. <clears throat> I, think I, think say that I, I think there's all kinds of opportunities still for, for more new good ideas. I, I think it's important for us to keep trying to start new ideas. But the idea of following through on things that we start at one IAT and then mature them, evolve them, keep reporting back on them, nothing in this space can be accomplished in one or two days, let alone almost one or two years. It seems like you need to keep a lot of follow through and pressure on. So I, I like the idea of continuing these tracks if maybe there's a way to do that plus still look at other things that we might want to introduce new. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. Hey, Lisa, or John, can you remind me, did we talk on the connected thought? I don't think we've had this implementation of thought since May when we decided as CDA management to withdraw the um, CDA 2.1. Uh, did we update on that on this call? And I, I'm, we, I was in and out a bit. No, okay. Very good point. I think that the one 
the main reason I like to update on it is because it still is confusing people that it doesn't mean CDA goes away any more than um, the the new IG uh, model is documentation. The uh, the logical model is for documentation, and people think it means we're going to fire. So those two things, if we can clarify here with this um, this group of implementers, it would be extremely useful, I think. I think yesterday we got the logical ID across and the fact that it's just a new way to document, but the there is a new version and the naming is awfully confusing. If you haven't heard this discussion before, CDA 2.1 was taken normative. A lot of work was done on it. It's a newer version of CDA. And it had some good features, but when we looked as a management group into the community and asked everybody, no one had an appetite to adopt that new CDA-based model. So uh, we made a formal decision at the May working group. We voted to withdraw that normative um, CDA, not CCDA, CDA version 2.1, and it and to uh, do that before uh, September 2024, and we're starting on it now. And then uh, when CDA 2.0 comes back up for reaffirmation, we will uh, reaffirm CDA 2.0, which is what the CDA 2.1 is built on. So if you see or hear that CCDA 2.1 is going away, you now all know that is not true and that we're talking about the base standard CDA 2.1 is being withdrawn. Yeah, you're you're talking about the CDA 2.0 core and the 2.1 core then, right? Exactly. The core schematrons that CCDA was based on. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Yeah. But the decision was made. The last time I think we asked for input from this group, um, and Lisa and others pursued input from the EMR community and the international community. And um, we still have all that material. It's on the CMG site, and including the training Calvin did. And so we have kept it in case it's needed. But, um, you know, you can count on the 2.0 base. CDA going forward for a while, maybe forever. But. So what's your, um, I guess, what's your, what's your takeaway for a newbie on that front? Uh, because I still don't understand really the difference between the two CDA 2.0. Oh. You never, you never implemented two dot CDA 2.1. So you mm -hmm. don't care. Yeah, <laughs> like, the new version of a standard. And other things would have moved to that, but then mm -hmm. nothing did. So it, it's something that went away. But that yes, and Matt, we're not using it. We did have an international partner at one point that was using it, but they they are no mm -hmm. longer doing that. They reverted to um to 2.0, and they're looking at the CDA CDA 2.1 IG guides for what they needed. And that is so. not even anywhere related to CCDA templates for clinical notes or 2.1. It. I have, yes, but let's not confuse people with that. I don't think. I think everything we're doing for ONC certification is CCDA 2.1. Is CDA 2.0? Very CDA 2.1 uses CDA 2.0. CDA right. 2.1 is a different thing from CCDA 2.1. It's like a right. different. The, it's super <laughs> Both the versions happen to be mm -hmm. 2.0 and 2.1 or whatever, but they're talking yeah. about different things. When we, talk about CDA, <laughs> when we talk about CDA, we're talking about um, not Your just, and CCDA clinical, we're talking about QRDA ones, QRDA twos, we're right, talking correct, about all correct. of the guides out there. That's the architect, right? And that's the diagram that we show correct. when we're correct. training. Okay. Right, 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 I've, yep. I just want to make sure yeah. Linda had that 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 point because she seemed like she really understood what it was. I hear more about, uh, CCDA than I do CDA. So I was just curious about those two specific differences. Yeah, I've got, if I can get it to open up here, I have a diagram I've shared with others before and I think it's it's useful, I'll, I'll share it. But it's, 
it just shows we call it internally our, the tech stack, right? Because right. it, <laughs> it, it's based. The RIM model was constrained and extended to make CDA, and then that was constrained and extended to make CCDA. So if you think of it from a fire perspective, that's how it it goes. But my uh, Microsoft PowerPoint wants to be challenging right now, so. Can't share it, but it's but it's as useful a layer to came, understand that. CDA yeah, is the, CDA is the foundational layer, yes. and then there's constraints on CDA to that make in the other layer cakes that make it more uh, uh, defined for a particular use case um, and uh, more specific for implementers. So implementation guides are built off of the underlying standard called CDA. Yep, that makes sense to me. My, 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 just a clarification, my main thing was about CDA only. I only was trying to get a feedback from Linda about CDA 2.0 versus CD, CDA 2.1. And I understand CDA as well as CCDA and how that relates. And I think the confusion, Matt, to everybody, not just you, is it, the newer version of the base standard, CDA was called 2.1. CCDA is also 2.1. They're different standards, but they both have the same version number. And exactly. so exactly. so people think when they hear something with 2.1 in it, that what we do every day with CCDA is going away, and it is not. Mm -hmm. And in January, it's CDA, CCDA 3.0. <laughs> yes, thank you, Gay. So we'll solve all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> we just maybe we should just not talk about it anymore until we get to 3.0 and then we yeah. then people go, if they say 2.1 is going away they'll go oh yeah because 3.0 three is coming out right, right. <laughs> okay. oh what a tangle web we weave <laughs> yep All right, um, and yeah, Dave did send the, the survey out. I got that in my email already. Everyone should have received it in their email, so please fill out that survey. Um, so obviously, this is the last IT of this year. The, the HL7 working group meeting is coming up in September. Um, it's too, The early bird was last week, so you've missed that, but hopefully I'll see a bunch of you at the Connectathon and or the working group meeting. That'll be great. Um, look for more information as we plan out the ITs in the new year. <clears throat> Uh, is there, I mean, I, I'll ask it here just a straw poll and, don't, you know, people can put up their hands or not, but is there, we haven't had an in-person IT in quite a while, and I know these virtual ones work really well, but is there any desire to have in-person? We can all get together and... Not unless you're something. coming to New Orleans. Yeah, we'll fly <laughs> to New Orleans. I mean, in the past, we've tied them to the working group meetings, but with the Connectathon and the working group meeting and everything, that gets to be too long. You, you're doing it like the Thursday, Friday, and people are... We're going to the working meeting they're there for a whole like week and a half so we have done them separately before so we could potentially look at that obviously there'd be travel costs and the cost to attend would be a little higher because there'd be lunch and the and the conference and whatever but if people are interested in that we could hopefully um work with dave on you know talking to onc for that so what i've noticed is that some of the some of the participants are able to do more work remotely because we had so many issues with not being able to do certain development outside of the network um, and things not being able to be done. It seems like there's ability for, and that that's not something that DHIT was dealing with, but I know at one point Epic and, and um, Cerner and some, I think Linda, you even had access issues that you couldn't do certain things while you weren't, while you were in the buildings we were in, whereas if we're remote, it seems like no one's really reported, I can't access that right now, or I won't be able to do that today, but I'll get back to you. Right. I couldn't access John's tool yesterday. Oh, that's I mean, true. Today, that was earlier just, today. That was momentarily, right? <laughs> no, it was because oh. it's a new tidy oh. setup. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. But to add to what Rochelle is saying, at the last live fire connectathon, the the CDA mapping group, we couldn't hear each other, we couldn't see each other's screens, 
we ended up huddled around two tables and then logged into a Zoom session where we were trying to listen to each other over our phones yeah. so that we could see each other's screens and stuff. I'm telling yeah, you, it that, was, that was the connectathon, was and that was a bad up. that was a bad venue for a connectathon. I mean, our IETs, we've had, you know, better. I we've had. Um, yeah, we do usually a better. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. True. But it still is easier to see each other's screens when you're looking at XML. And I think, you know, over the last couple of IATs, we got back to our roots where people were actually generating examples and looking at code. And that's a lot easier to do when you can see each other's screens more easily. Mm -hmm. I think from bringing in new people, you know, some of these vicary HRs that are here, uh, if you noticed, some of those uh, people that were involved with what we were doing were only able to get enough time to log in for the the time we were actually doing it. Right. Yeah, and we wouldn't get those people if it was on site. That's very true. So if it was a combination, if it was a hybrid situation where those that want to meet can meet in person and those and then allow the rest to be a Zoom. I don't know if that's possible, but. Um, yeah, I have to agree. You know, I don't think I could be traveling. I couldn't send our developers to travel and be exclusively there for that while we're trying to meet our own needs and our own, you know, development efforts that we're trying to do. Yeah, it sounds like remote is the way to go. If we did a hybrid version, they actually HL7 isn't that wonderful with supporting uh, hybrid versions, um, except for sometimes. And it would well, again at working group meetings, not so much, but if we're on a separate venue, we could. But yeah, yeah. I'm saying I'm hearing from everyone that, that virtual is the way to go. So it would be the same boring regular HL7 attendees that would be in person. Yeah, this doesn't yeah. feel uh this doesn't feel COVID related either. I mean, I think we I think it might have started you know because of that, but it feels very natural. It doesn't feel like I'm still doing old protocol, it feels like we're doing what, what feels right. Yep. And I really enjoyed the pictures. I feel like, you know, I learned new things about where Gay went on vacation and Matt's family and the aquarium and, you know, Linda hasn't been to Maine. We did really improve the social aspect of what we've got and feeling like we get to know each other a little bit better. So I, I think we're kind of getting into the best of both worlds. Okay. No, that's nice. Let me just throw it out there and see what people thought. So. Yeah, yeah I appreciate. A, uh, oh, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th th there was an HL7 security event that kind of went down. And I, I just kept asking myself, why are they doing things like the IAT does? I can't see people. I'm not talking to anybody. I can't make comments. Like it, it, it felt a little impersonal. So, so, you know, we definitely have some things here that are, that are just working. Yeah, the, um, the security event did have twice as many people. So we definitely have a good size group here for collaboration and talking. I mean, really at any one time, we only have around 30 or 35 in attendance on these IATs. So you're at that point, you're looking at, you know, just like a regular classroom in high school, right? Um, and then with the security <laughs> event, um, I didn't attend it. I was, I was helping Sandy, you know, in the project management arena to prep for it. But um, I also believe that was more connectathon-ish, where you went off on tracks, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it might have been a different platform. Um, Most, but I was going to uh, say, I do appreciate uh, the the open and, openness and honesty about face-to-face -to, -face to, to virtual. And I, I, and I kind of, a, I'm not surprised to hear what I've he heard, because yes, the expense for an F face-to-face, -face, while you do get, you know, that, that, it is great to collaborate in person. Um, we've done so many virtual ones now, and it was really surprising to hear like you didn't think it was due to COVID at all. And I, maybe this one never was virtual due to COVID. It was more, hey, with the tasks at hand, we think virtual will, will work. Oh, so you never had IIT in person before? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah we, no, we yeah. did yeah. Yep. five yep. or so. Not, okay, 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 Roger that, okay, okay. I also think we can, pull in, it, it's probably easier to pull in some experts at HL7 for portions of this um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. have them facilitate sections um, that we need support with, not making Lisa and and um, DD or certain people have to manage the entire um, implementation on. Um, I think that Gay, you really contributed today sitting in, in that session. And I know you intended to join, but 
if it's possible if we needed bread or needed someone else to cover, maybe they would be willing to come in for an hour or two versus a two day process. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. I think Russ and Rebecca was a great example. You know, exactly. that would have been a lot of ex extra expense, but for just one little dose and bringing them in and learning all that we learned about that dental IG was fabulous. And that yeah. probably cost very little to make that happen. Yeah, no, I think the virtual works great, but I guess it means I'll never get to play on John's Pac-Man if he doesn't bring it to a face-to-face. -face. <laughs> He's going to have to bring it to the connect-a-thons yeah. <laughs> or to the working group meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that's happening, but yeah, okay. It's not going to happen, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, are there any other closing thoughts? If not... We can end uh, five, half an hour early. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, like I said, I look forward to seeing some of you at the working group meeting and Connectathon coming up. And um, yeah, and stay oh, tuned John, for more information. John, on John, we should we. We should say that the, the save the date pattern, even though we can't give people the actual date, we can say that we believe there will be two IATs next year. And in general, for budgeting, for people who will be planning what their, um, you know, their time and allocation to budget for two IATs next year, one in the spring and one in the tail end of the summer. Yep, I would agree with that. Lisa. I wasn't going to go so far because, you know, I don't know where funding goes, but yeah, it I, speaks, you know, everyone listens. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't, I can't guarantee it with the funding because uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't remember the details of all the funding, but um, certainly the ONC always likes these IATs and with the virtual, um, with the virtual format, it, in the scheme of things, it's not nearly as much as it used to be. So, um that that announcement will come out in due time. Hey, I, I know a lot of. Yeah. Go ahead. I oh, a lot of people budget ahead of time, Dave. And the reason that I'm bringing it up like that is that yep. if we do save the dates, um, you know, conceptually, people could be planning their budgets for next year right now this summer. And so I think it's just great to have them have a high probability to put that placeholder in their budget. Yep. I, I always am pushing the ONZ to say, hey, let's get some things started earlier rather than later. And and no surprise, um, the government doesn't move quickly on approvals. So it always seems like we, we end up behind the eight ball. But I, I, I hear you, Lisa. I would love to be able to say, OK, yep, we know when it's going to be. We know it's approved and let's announce it. And, you know, just just from like a CMG listserv point of view. Right. That's that's really yeah. getting the, the most of the most of the people. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody could say something in their survey when you all fill out your survey. If you think that that's a great idea to have two IATs funded for next year, say so in your survey. Yes. Or more. I, <laughs> I cannot emphasize. I look at every single comment in that survey as Lisa and Sean and Joe Ginder and Susan know and Jim knows. I look at everyone and I group them so that we can tackle them at you know as a group so yes i do look at those surveys all right sorry sorry john to end your to stomp on your your closing but i i just didn't want to miss that window <laughs> no worries i already stomped on his closing by bringing up this uh what we call it the tech stack slide to the question about ccda and cda I just think this is a good visual representation of it. It was started by my friend, Nick Radoff, and we use it internally a lot when we go to explain this. I've shared it actually with HL7 for stuff too, but it just explains how, uh, you know, the RIM, the reference information model with its vocabulary and XML and data types define the first CDA, which was really not used much, and then the CDA R2, um, and, it then built on top of that is was the CCDA with its two versions. And they had a set number of templates in the first one. And then in 2.1, they added um, some additional templates. And then over to the side, we we didn't know what to do with hit BC32, but we stuck it over there. But um, you see that along it, it, the CDA 
encompasses things like QRDA, like um, uh, Rochelle mentioned, and mm -hmm. uh, others. But I just thought this to me is always a great visualization of how those documents work together. So I wanted to share if it's useful. And I guess yeah, that's but, how we all remember Alice Newman very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think anybody who's just coming across the, you know, abbreviations, just really getting that grasp of CDA versus CCDA, that'll that'll just, you know, uh, guide you a, a, a very long way. But this visual definitely helps as well. And, and just and just knowing the different types of document types also aids in ver uh, better clarity of uh, CCDA 2.1. Yeah, one of my pet peeves is when somebody comes to me and says, can you get this out of a CCD? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> what do you mean when you say CCD, right? <laughs> can, you, um, can we have that slide, uh, Linda, just to sure. post some place? I found that really no, useful. Thank you. Thank you. Because mm -hmm. I've been confused by version numbers for months, it feels like. <laughs> And to my friends on here, you'll notice we don't even talk about 2.0, right? <laughs> right? Linda, check chat. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to end. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> nice are you game. sure? Yep, I am <laughs> sure. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And Thank uh, you, everyone. See you, see you again. Thanks see you so later. Much. All right, bye. Thank you. Fill out that survey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gay. <laughs>